Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm going to get started now. It's about 2 o'clock. So once again, thanks everybody for coming to uh, today's webinar from Hydromantis. We're going to be talking today about uh, ToxChem uh, version 4.0 for modeling microconstituents at uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants. So for those who may not have met me before, my name is Spencer Snowling, and uh, I'm Vice President in charge of business and product development here at Hydromantis. And uh, I've been hosting a series of these uh, webinars uh, for the better part of this year so far on various topics. And I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about using ToxChem uh, in the context of a municipal wastewater treatment plant and using it to study the uh, fate of microconstituents in a municipal plant. So my uh, plan for today is to have a, a brief introduction to Hydromantis, to look at uh, how we go about modeling microconstituents, and then introduce you to ToxCam version 4 if you've not had the opportunity to see it before. I'm going to do a live desktop uh, demonstration of uh, how to build a plant and add some microconstituents to your influence stream and do a little bit of modeling and some sensitivity analysis, and then have a few concluding thoughts on uh, what we see our users using ToxChem for uh, at the moment and how it can be useful for your particular engineering practice. And lastly, we'll try and leave a few moments at the end uh, to, to allow some time to ask some questions. And uh, I hopefully will be able to get that all done in uh, about 30 minutes and, and then get you back uh, to your uh, regular job. So just to briefly uh, mention Hydromantis, if you have not uh, been a part of our modeling community in the past, uh, just this, uh, a couple of months ago, we celebrated our 26th anniversary. And uh, we are located in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, we are about an hour west of Toronto. And uh, I'm speaking to you today from our head office in downtown Hamilton. And our business focus is basically twofold. We supply engineering software tools that are based around modeling and simulation. And we also provide municipal and industrial wastewater process uh, consulting services that go along with that. And we uh, take our technology and uh, develop it and employ it in a number of unique ways for different clients. And we provide a number of uh, other support services to our regular modeling clientele. As you may know, we have uh, four software products, uh, ToxCam, which I'll be talking about to you today, and which we released a new version of uh, a couple of months ago. We have a, a modeling package for drinking water called WattPro. We have what is our essentially our flagship product, GPSX, and that's for doing uh, wastewater treatment process modeling and simulation and optimization. And we have CapDetWorks, which is for preliminary design and uh, costing. So for today, we're going to be talking about uh, the presence of microconstituents and micropollutants in a, in a municipal context in a, in a municipal wastewater treatment plant. And as you may know, uh, you often see uh, pharmaceuticals and other types of uh, microconstituents at low levels in wastewater treatment processes. Uh, you know, typically things like uh, medicine, hormones, painkillers, and uh, other types of drugs that are going to be excreted from the population. We have a number of personal care products that are uh, frequently found, fragrances, uh, other things that are not terribly readily biodegradable make their way to the wastewater treatment process and can potentially be converted or changed into other forms. And if you are a wastewater treatment uh, plant that is uh, also receiving industrial waste, you can, re you can also therefore receive any other combination of, of other components such as uh, phthalates and nonalphenols, oxalates, and other things that are, are part of production processes are used in the creation and manufacture of different types of products and then therefore can make their way to your treatment plant and be part of your effluent that's going out to your receiving water. So as you may know, uh, in 2002, the USGS uh, surveyed a number of uh, streams across the United States, 139 receiving water bodies, and, detectable, and found detectable concentrations of microconstituents in about 80% of those streams. So we know that they are there, they are present as uh, <clears throat> sources of effluent into those streams, and they are making their way to the drinking water uh, that we drink every day. And so therefore, we've had a number of clients over the years ask us if we can uh, model microconstituents in a wastewater treatment process to optimize the best way to, to get rid of those, to capture them into the sludge, or other ways that they can be removed from the system and otherwise remove them from uh, what could be uh, 
effluent from your wastewater treatment plant. So over the years, uh, we've been using ToxCam and GPSX to perform this type of service. And it is a challenging uh, thing uh, uh, to model properly. The microconstituents themselves have a number of um, uh, processes under which uh, they are captured and or transformed into other things. And so uh, you see a wide range of behavior, uh, a, a wide range of fates for microconstituents in wastewater treatment plants. Uh, captured here, here from this um, uh, wastewater treatment plant in Braunschweig in Germany, where a couple of years ago there was a study uh, looking at different types of um, um, microconstituents, particularly medications. In this particular case, ibuprofen and carbamazepine that I'm going to be or, uh, demonstrating here shortly. And you can see that in some cases they're very widely biodegradable. Here, 96% of, of this ibuprofen is being removed in their activated sludge process. However, basically none of the car carbamazepine is being removed at all. And uh, that depends on a number of things, the biodegradability, the, the uh, ability or the hydrophobicity of that particular uh, component and whether it's going to be um, uh, sorbed onto the sludge. So what uh, we are proposing is that ToxCam is our best tool to be able to do this. And uh, it's a tool that's designed to be able to, to model the fate of uh, organic compounds and metals and wastewater treatment systems. It's a product that was developed by a company called Enviromega back in 1991. About five or six years ago, we acquired Enviromega along with their simulation products. And we have continued to develop the product since then. Right now, we find that uh, one of the uses, uh, frequent uses of, of ToxCam is to be able to use it as an estimation of, emission, of emissions from wastewater treatment plants. And uh, the US EPA has, in many cases, accepted the use of ToxCam uh, as, a, as a way to accurately report or at least give a good estimate of what you feel is, is leaving your wastewater treatment plant. So one thing that uh, ToxCam does quite well is to be able to model the volatilization of VOCs that are coming off of the plant. So any place where you may find that you have a drop where there's some sort of hydraulic uh, mixing or activity happening uh, from large quiescent surfaces or obviously from, from places like this and where you have mechanical or diffused aeration going on and there is a lot of uh, oxygen mass transfer happening and that gives the opportunity for volatile compounds to to be transferred to the air as well. So basically, ToxCam takes a, a sort of a multi-fate uh, approach here. Uh, we can uh, model the release of the volatile organics both to the atmosphere or to a covered surface. If you have tanks that are covered, we can model that headspace concentration as well. That can be important for emissions, for looking for explosive situations, or any other concentrations that's relevant to, to, to workers in your plant. We can look at uh, what is the concentration in your activated sludge uh, plant, and, and particularly for in the aeration basin where your biology is happening, to see whether you might be reaching, reaching some sort of toxic level. And it can be used also to estimate the amount of organics and metals that is being concentrated into the sludge and removed from your plant. And lastly, by doing a mass balance, that leaves how much was left over uh, that's going to be going out to your receiving water. And particularly for endocrine disrupting compounds, we want to be able to estimate what's that overall effluent concentration going to look like. So ToxChem does this basically to four phase. We model the volatilization, uh, any place where you have an open surface or some sort of hydraulic change, some sort of turbulence. Uh, through biodegradation, and we have a number of different types of models that uh, will model that, uh, first order kinetics and a few different other things. And uh, 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 it's a simpler approach than we take in GPSX, but it, it is relatively sophisticated. We look at the sorption of different components onto the sludge itself. So looking at different types of sorption relationships and different components uh, have different levels of, of hydrophobicity. And then also, uh, anything that becomes an oil or grease, captured as part of oil or grease, that's removed from the system, we figure out how much uh, micro-constituent components are, are being taken away with it. And then whatever is left over goes out through your, your effluent. So if you've seen uh, a GPS, uh, pardon me, uh, ToxChem uh, before in the past, uh, you may have seen the older version with the older look to the interface. That was version 3.3. And as of last uh, month, or actually about six weeks ago, we released ToxChem version 4.0, which has a fully designed 
a redesigned interface and newly updated database of chemical component properties. So it's used uh, uh, by taking the elements from the left-hand side, the individual unit process models, putting them onto the drawing board in this area here to create your plant. You can then add as many contaminants as you like and get a summary of their fate on a unit by unit process or on an overall mass balance for the plant. So here you could see that a certain amount has been biodegraded, a certain amount was lost to the air, and a certain amount was taken away through the sludge. So I am going to hop over to my desktop uh, as uh, right now and uh, do a quick demonstration for you. So one moment while I get rid of my uh, pointers here. OK. So as I mentioned, you can create a uh, model of a wastewater treatment plant by dragging from the collection of unit processes on the left-hand side. So I'm going to start with uh, an influent object, and then I'm now putting on a, a primary clarifier. I'm going to grab a diffused aeration activated sludge basin and then I'm going to put a secondary clarifier on the end of that. So let's uh, zoom in here, and you can see that uh, we just drag and connect. This is very much uh, similar to what we do with all of our pieces of software, where you create models of wastewater treatment plants by hooking up a, up a number of individual unit processes together. And as with all of those, you can open up the parameters menu and specify the physical characteristics, such as the surface area and depth and so forth, of each of the uh, tanks and the clarifiers and so forth. So uh, what I'm going to do now is also add effluent objects. So uh, these are to be able to get a summary of the fate of all of the releases of uh, the components to the atmosphere. So I'm going to gather up all of the effluent from the uh, various open surfaces here and put them into one object. Therefore, we can calculate the, uh, the overall loading to that uh, uh, particular, uh, uh, collect them all up and add them together so you can look at them in one place. Uh, we're going to create an effluent for our, our uh, effluent water quality and then also for the sludge. And we will take uh, flows from the, the two clarifiers to represent the sludge being hauled away from the plant. OK, so that's a fairly simple plant, uh, typical activated sludge. And the way that you add your micro constituents is you can uh, go here, specify your influent temperature and flow and VSS and so forth. It's uh, less complicated than GPSX. You don't have to do a lot of COD fractionation. Uh, but then we pop over to the contaminants. And what this is going to do is going to open up our database of over 800 components that are in this list here of various types of organics including many of the um, uh, micro constituents that are of concern today. So I'm going to start out very simply by grabbing a, a couple of different types of, uh, of, of typical things you might find in a plant. There's some acetone, and I also uh, want to add some benzene. Pardon me while I find that. And I'm going to add uh, a one type of estrogen here as well, and I'm going to add some uh, one metal. And that will allow us to, uh, to basically uh, model that plant. We can then specify the uh, influent concentrations. I think for this demonstration, I'm just going to leave them at their default values. And then we can run the simulation. So this is a steady state tool. It solves all the different concentrations throughout the plant and gives you a summary in the table down here. So for acetone, this is something that is going to be almost completely biodegraded. So if I uh, uh, grab my uh, arrow here, and I point right in the very lower left-hand corner. Uh, we can see down here next to my green arrow that the amount of, uh, of acetone that was biodegraded was over 95% of all of that was coming into that particular plant. So we can also see that uh, you know we're not having very much release to the atmosphere at all, and uh, the amount that's being uh, uh, left to the plant is about 2%. So I'm going to then uh, flip over here to benzene. And you'll immediately notice that um, the, the drawing board itself is showing that uh, we're seeing these, these the colored areas. So the green is indicating where the lowest amounts of em air emissions are coming from. There's some more significant emissions coming off that primary clarifier. 
So in this particular case with benzene, we're getting a bit more uh, uh, value for, uh, pardon me, a bit more um, uh, uh, biodegradation, but some more coming off in the, in the volatilization as well. We get different amounts here for the uh, estrogen, of course, because uh, uh, it's not volatile and it is also, for the most part, not showing to be very biodegradable at all. So most of that is going to be going out with, uh, with the sludge. Okay, so what I'm going to do then, if that's a, sort of a quick demonstration of how you build a plant and run a simulation uh, in Toxchem, is uh, I'd like to just illustrate that you can quickly uh, generate a report with all those details and have that uh, exported out to Excel directly from Toxchem. Uh, so here I've created a uh, report. You get all of the details about how you set it up and what your fate summaries were. You can also uh, look at each one of the individual tabs, and that will show you the uh, details for each one of the individual unit processes in your model. Okay. So I'm going to pop back to my slides here for a moment. And just mentioned briefly some of the new things that are available in version 4. We improved the interface, as you've seen here, with some new objects, some new unit process models. We expanded our database of contaminants as well. Uh, we have previously had about 250 contaminants. We now have close to 800. Uh, we've uh, expanded uh, quite a, so that we can have more VOCs, more um, uh, endocrine disrupting, disrupting compounds, and a number of pharmaceutical and personal care products, as uh, I'll show you uh, in a moment. All of these items are customizable, so if there is a component that you would like to be able to model using Toxchem, uh, but you don't see it in our list, uh, you can add your own custom components where you'll be asked to enter in things, you know, some known things such as the uh, density and molecular weight and so forth. Uh, Henry's law coefficient, some sort of absorption uh, evaluation in one kind or another, octanol water coefficient is the most typical one, and some sort of biodegradability coefficient. And that allows us to be able to model all of those fates uh, simultaneously, and that is how you go about calibrating the model as well. You can specify new components that may behave in a special way in your particular plant, or you can work from the pile of components that we have available in our database. We've uh, improved uh, the, some of the predictions, uh, particularly for uh, pH dependency for volatilization of those VOCs. Uh, we've added uh, more unit processes, and we've improved uh, the dependency on SRT as well. I am illustrated earlier that we have uh, new improved reporting features that allow you to generate all of the results to an MS, uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet uh, automatically. And lastly, for those who may have been using it in the past, uh, we can take uh, layouts and custom databases, custom components from your old version of Toxcam, and they can be loaded directly into the new version, and they get imported and converted up to the new version directly. Okay, so I'd like to uh, go back to uh, my uh, Toxcam demonstration now and uh, show you a couple of examples of how you uh, might use it to, to model and study the fate of different types of of microconstituents in a municipal plant. And so we're going to do a couple of different types of sensitivity analysis. And for this per, uh, particular example here, uh, we're going to be looking at a number of different types. I tried to select some uh, uh, that are going to give different types of behaviors and react differently to a uh, different operation of that plant. So we have a fragrance here, HHCD, a polycyclic musk. Uh, we have a brominated flame retardant that is going to be as a, sort of a known endocrine disrupting compound. Triclosan, which you may know is an antibacterial or antifungal agent found in a lot of uh, toothpastes and uh, soaps. Uh, carbamazepine, which I've seen quite a number of times in talks uh, at WestEc and other places that uh, is used as a very hard to break down, very non-biodegradable uh, component. Uh, it is an anti-epileptic drug and it sticks to the sludge really well. And uh, we'll add one estrogenic compound as, as well there, 17-beta uh, estradiol, which uh, for brevity, what we're, is called E2, and that's a, a human estrogen. So I have uh, gone ahead and set up a uh, model of a typical wastewater treatment plant. So that's more or less the same plant that I had before. And if I go in here and look at these parameters, you can see that I have specified those five components there. 
Uh, again, just for comparison's sake, I've left all of the concentrations the same so that we can easily compare them uh, to each other. So there's our five components in our wastewater treatment plant. And I'm going to uh, solve that plant for steady state. And we can immediately see here that uh, this um, uh, uh, estradiol that's being shown here, the, the, the very first uh, uh, set of results that are shown at the top here, uh, so for that estrogenic compound, we're getting about, uh, let me grab my pointer again, uh, we're getting about 87% of that particular compound being biodegraded in the activated sludge system and about 3% going out to the sludge and, uh, and most of the rest of that, about 10% going out to the wastewater effluent over here. And so that's a, sort of, a, as expected, it's a fairly uh, a biodegradable compound. If we go and look at some of the other ones, um, so if we look at triclosan, for example, uh, this is uh, a much more, um, uh, uh, pardon me, a much more hydrophobic compound. And so we can see down here, if we look in the corner again, uh, over 90% of this particular component is going out to the sludge. And it's not uh, being biodegraded, only 4% uh, and so on. So. Uh, one of the more interesting ones to look at is uh, our carbon mezepine, and it has uh, uh, an interesting fate in the sense that it is neither biodegradable nor particularly hydrophobic. So it is, uh, in this particular case, showing uh, approximately 35% of it is floating right through the plant without any treatment whatsoever. So the way that talks can, can be used to understand the fate of these things is to perform an automatic sensitivity analysis. And that is done uh, by taking, going up to the uh, uh, model analysis menu at the top here and selecting sensitivity analysis. And so uh, what you can do at this point is any, uh, select different parameters from the model to be adjusted and it will solve the model at a range of different values. So I'm going to very uh, easily start out by looking at the E2 estrogen compound. And I'm going to um, adjust for uh, different levels of mixed liquor. So this will give us uh, a study of, you know, if we operated this plant at a different mixed liquor or a different SRT, how is that going to affect the ultimate fate of these five compounds in our particular plant? So let's start out by uh, uh, running a series where we're going to solve the model at uh, mixed liquor compounds from, uh, pardon me, li mixed liquor concentration starting at 1,500 milligrams per liter up to 5,000. So if I, I run that, it solves it fairly quickly. We can see that for the estrogen, uh, this green line here is uh, essentially um, the biodegradability fa uh, factor. So this is showing that uh, starting on the very left-hand side at the low mixed liquor, about 80% already we know is going to be biodegraded. And as you go to the higher mixed liquor, you've got more biomass, and therefore you're getting up to about 90%. But it's a fairly flat line. It goes from 80 to 90, roughly. So we're, we're seeing that for the range of mixed liquors and SRTs that we're running here, that the uh, estradiol compound is going to be biodegraded for the most part. Now, if I move to looking at uh, one of the other compounds instead, I'm going to switch over to triclosan and then rerun this uh, same analysis. The uh, biodegradability line, which is the uh, green one, is way down here at the bottom. And so we're noting that it is not uh, biodegradable particularly. And this pink line is representing the amount that's being removed through the sludge. Again, it's a fairly flat line. And of course, it makes sense that it increases with increasing mixed liquor. So the higher the mixed liquor we run, the more sludge we're producing. And because triclosan is going to be primarily bound to the sludge as its way of being removed from the plant, uh, the more sludge we have, the more that's being reduced. So, but again, it's not particularly sensitive to running at all these different mixed liquors. The same percentage is being moved across. So one of the, uh, again, interesting ones to look at, if I flip this menu now to car carbamazepine and rerun that, we can see that this is a component that is sensitive to mixed liquor. So in this particular case, right at the lower mixed liquor levels, we can see that uh, about 40% of that is being removed to the sludge. And then the remainder, this black line, is showing that uh, the remainder is going out to the effluent. And so um, in this case, moving to different mixed liquors is going to make a large difference. And if you move to uh, 4,000 or thereabouts, more of it is going to be going out to the sludge rather than running down here at 17, 17,000, pardon me, 1,700, where you may be uh, getting uh, more of it going out to the effluent than would be taken out through the sludge. 
So just by running a quick sensitivity analysis here, we could see that uh, for those particular five components, uh, some of them are not uh, sensitive to the way that the plant is being run in terms of its mix li mixed liquor or SRT. However, this particular one is, uh, and you can optimize your plant and look at the effect that it's going to have if you try to optimize your operation for the removal of carbon magazine. Okay, so I'm going to flip over to another example. This next example is one that is available uh, right in ToxChem. We have a typical municipal wastewater treatment system already put together here. <clears throat> and it has a different set of components. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at acetone, benzene, uh, chloroform, uh, and dichlorobenzene and methanol. So these are some other uh, different substrate types, obviously, and methanol and uh, other things that you may find in, like uh, possibly chloroform in a municipal plant. So if I run this particular uh, uh, model, uh, we can see that acetone, uh, if we look down here in the lower left-hand corner again, we see that it's, uh, pardon me while I grab my pointer, uh, it's 98% uh, removed through biodegradation, and methanol is also very similar. However, I'm going to come back to the top here and flip to chloroform. Chloroform is interesting because uh, not only uh, does it undergo uh, several different fates, here we can see that uh, about 41% uh, is being biodegraded, 20% is being lost out through the effluent, and uh, about 38, almost 40% of it is being uh, lost to the atmosphere. You'll notice here the, uh, on, the, on the primary clarifier that we're losing some emissions through the surface there. Obviously through the, uh, an pardon me, through the aerated part of this DNR plant, uh, this is an anoxic zone. Uh, an anaerobic zone and an and a, uh, uh, aerated zone. Uh, that uh, the, In the aerated section, of course, we're having quite a lot of uh, mass transfer to volatilization there. And uh, as the red indicates here, we're losing a lot of this particular component to the atmosphere. One other thing that's happening is we're, the, the talk cam is pointing out that 40% of what's in the plant, if we look in our lower left-hand table again, is being formed within the plant itself through chlorine addition. So this last uh, unit process here at the end is the chlorine contact chamber. And so the model is predicting that in this particular case, chloroform is being uh, formed here and, of course, immediately going out to the effluent. And that's where about 40% of all of this, the chloroform in this plant is coming from. So just to uh, take another quick look at an interesting sensitivity analysis, you could uh, do, in this case, leaving it so that we're looking at chloroform, you could look at uh, what kind of different behavior we get at different temperatures. So I'm going to run something from 5 degrees Celsius up to 25 degrees. And you can see here that uh, overall there, it's a fairly insensitive to temperature in this particular situation. Uh, that tends to happen when uh, you know, you're know you looking at these types of systems. Uh, if you're in a colder situation, you often are um, uh, you know, faced with less biological activity happening, but at the same time, you're also losing less through volatility, through volatilization, and so uh, it's hanging around in the aeration basin uh, a little longer and allows it to be a little bit more biodegraded. So it's kind of a wash sometimes, depending on your particular compound. And one last quick uh, demonstration, too, of our new uh, pH uh, analysis. Uh, I'm going to, oh, sorry, not this uh, municipal or industrial plant. I've got a different uh, one here. Uh, this is one that we prepared for a uh, petrochemical client. It has a DAF unit, and in this particular case, we were looking at uh, um, a number of different components specific to their particular industry, but hydrogen sulfide is a very interesting one to look at as well. And so if I run this particular um, model again and I, I look at the results for hydrogen sulfide, immediately you can see volatility is, a, is an issue here. Uh, if I do a sensitivity analysis here on the H2S and I do it with pH in this particular case, I'm going to go down to the pH here and I'm going to run this uh, model again from the pHs of 4 to 12. Uh, it solves here. We can see that there's uh, obviously uh, a break point here, which uh, as we move across the pK value for H2S, that uh, on one side of it, uh, we have quite a bit more available for volatilization to the air. Uh, but once you get up in past about 7.5 in your pH, uh, it's not nearly as much as being released to the air, and consequently, it's being available to be, to be biodegraded. So 
this is a way to illustrate, uh, you know, the different fates are dependent on the different operating parameters in your model, uh, pardon me, in your plant, and you can use a model to figure out what those important things are. Okay, so I'm going to pop back to my slides here as I'm coming to the uh, end of my time and just uh, wind up with a couple of thoughts. So, as I mentioned, we currently have a number of our users using ToxChem uh, for reporting of uh, VOC and, and HAP emissions uh, to the US EPA. Uh, we have a number of people using it for planning and designing and optimization of uh, wastewater treatment systems. And uh, particularly, we have a number of people just using it for the purposes of, of understanding the inventory of these contaminants in their plant. Which and what are the fates? Where is this stuff going and, and how can we make adjustments to the plant to, to mitigate its release? So uh, as we, we like to say, uh, modeling of the fate of these things in a wastewater treatment plant with ToxCam is, is pretty straightforward. You build your plant, you uh, select your contaminants of interest, and then you uh, run your simulation and you observe your emissions. It's, it's a relatively uh, straightforward program to use because uh, it doesn't require a lot of extensive calibration. It's uh, using those uh, physical properties that are contained in the database. Uh, you can always go in and adjust them, the, adjust the biodegradable uh, constant, uh, for example. But for the most part, uh, those are known numbers, and they work quite well. So I'll mention one uh, for, for our GPSX users who do a lot of process modeling. Uh, we have a number of people who usually ask, uh, you know, can you model microconstituents in GPSX as well? And the uh, short answer to that is, uh, yes, you can, uh, with some help from us. It's a way that we can combine GPSX and ToxCam for you. So if you can create your GPSX process layout and then select a number of microconstituents that you would like to be able to model within GPSX, uh, we can then customize that model and, and deliver it to you. And so here's an example of one that's been set up with triclosan and benzoapyrene and an estrogen uh, in, in the GPSX layout. So I'll briefly mention that uh, uh, if you've been to our website recently, you may have noticed that we have our new video library. We have now added uh, ToxChem to that library as well. So we have about uh, 35 or 40 minutes worth of ToxChem video that you can watch. It's essentially taking you through all the steps of how to use all the features in ToxChem. And we are running another ToxCam webinar in two days from now, talking about air emissions within the petrochemical industry. If that's of interest to you, you can go to our website and go to the Webinars tab and click for registration. We also have a, another, coming, uh, another couple of webinars coming up shortly, one for CapDet Works in a few weeks, and then one in August on using GPSX to optimize and design upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors. We're also offering web-based training for all of our products. And you can find out more about that at the training tab uh, on our website. And lastly, I'd like to uh, say that we do, in addition to uh, all of our uh, uh, software products, we do offer a number of consulting services. Uh, we do team with our clients, with uh, the people who use our software to, to help them bid on projects. So we can be hired to be a, a sub on your consulting bid. Uh, we do model building. We develop uh, custom models, and we calibrate them for people. We help people design uh, sampling programs and bench scale studies for the calibration of their models. And as I mentioned, yeah, we can be uh, brought in as on your team to be your advanced modeling experts. So if you're interested in that, please contact us and we can help you uh, uh, prepare your bid. <laughs>